very good afternoon to everyone and all and welcome to this occasion of International Women's Day. Thank you, Secretary Deputy, for gracing this occasion of celebration of Women's Day with your kind presence. Women scientists have been playing an important role in scientific growth of India. Their outstanding contribution to science and societal growth has been remarkable. The department has a mandate of promoting women in science and science for women. And it is also very important that we acknowledge contribution of women scientists who have done excellent work. In order to recognize the outstanding work done by the women scientists who are in permanent positions, outstanding contribution in the areas of biosciences and biotechnology, the department had initiated National Bioscience Awards for Women Scientists in the year 1999. These were renamed as Janaki Amal Awards in the year 2019. Padma Dr. Janaki Amal was a pioneering biobotanist, Director General of Botanic Survey of India. There is a small flower variety of Mongolia plant named after her, called the Mongolia Kobal Janki Amal. The awards are given in two categories, senior category and young category. In the senior category, senior women scientists are awarded for lifetime contributions and excellent research in the country. In young category, award is given to women scientists below the age of 45 years for outstanding contribution in research with potential for application, product and technology development. This carries cash prize, citation, gold medal, as well as research grant also in the young category. So far, 72 women scientists have been awarded since inception. Today we have with us Dr. Eshwarya Lakshmi and Professor Shamishta Banerjee, the awardees, who will talk about how this award brought a change in their careers. With the aim to promote women in science and in attempt to enhance the participation of women scientists in biotechnology research, we had launched a biocare program for women scientists in the year 2011. The purpose is to give an opportunity also to women scientists who are not in regular positions or had a break in their careers to get their first independent research grant including fellowship and thus a chance to get back to the mainstream of science. Through this scheme, we have been able to support around 360 women scientists with their first research grants. Many who were unemployed at the time of getting their respective biotech projects have now got permanent employment in various institutes, universities and industries. More than 400 papers have been published 11 patents have been filed and one international patent has been granted recently, which is remarkable as these are from their own companies. Last year on this occasion, one biopsy awardee who got permanent employment in an Indian Central University had spoken and one who became co-founder and CEO of the company had shared her journey. Today we have Dr. Ananti who will talk about role of biopsy in her journey, right from getting her first independent project to foundation of her own company. Through this, she has created employment not only for her, but for many others. We also have Dr. Lakshmi Prasanna, who has recently been granted a US patent from her biotech project. They will share their success stories before and after getting their first independent biotech R&D project and how it made impact on their careers. They will also talk about how their novel idea we saw light of the day through this scheme. Besides these, it is also important to acknowledge the work of great women scientists of India who started their scientific journeys in 1900th century and made a mark in STEM area. And what is better than to showcase their stories, journeys, and thus inspire the minds of India. In order to do so, an exhibition through posters will be put up in colleges from next month with aim and hope that this exhibition will motivate young students, that is the uh, building blocks of India, to take or continue science as a career and contribute to socio-economic growth of India. This was planned two years ago, but could not be executed due to COVID-19 pandemic, but colleges are not open now. Thank speakers, scientists, principals, lecturers, teachers and students from various institutes, universities and colleges who have joined this event. Hope all of our efforts, today's event and talks will motivate youngsters to take science as a career, help women researchers and scientists who have just started their careers or those who wish to revive their careers and thus help in creation of a strong generation of human leadership in science and technology in future. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful summary of the journey. Now I request Dr. Sanjay Kumar Mishra, Senior Advisor, Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India, to give his address. Dr. Mishra, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Once again, uh, on behalf of the Department of Biotechnology, I would like to extend my warm greetings on this International uh, Women's Day, which is celebrated on 8th of March every year. Now, on this day, <clears throat> I think this is the time for all of us 
to reiterate how important role the women have been playing and <coughs> are playing into all walks of life and all spheres of life, including science and technology. I would like to just give you, you know, uh, just brief points that why women in general are so important into the education sector and into the science and technology sector. Uh, <clears throat> first, if you, if you take the sustainable development goals, uh, there are a number of goals, but goal number five, which is specifically talking about the promotion and support of the women into the education and providing them all support. Now, if you do, you know, just a brief analysis, you'll find that if we support number five, if women are being empowered, all other sustainable goals will be much more easier to achieve because, because this is a horizon, you know, uh, presence into achieve, in achieving all other goals. So, so this is not only really important for the benefit of women, women, but in achievement of overall sustainable development. Now, second point is sometimes we uh, think that by promoting women scientists, we are helping them or we are helping individual women scientists, whether they are into the education sector or into workforce. Now, if you read the several research papers and analysis, uh, you know, right, uh, which has been done by the researchers and also confirmed by the recent studies of the World Bank and IMF, they have shown that, that the, <clears throat> whenever the participation of increases into workforce, I'm not talking about science and technology, but in general, then that workforce is uh, the increased workforce having a diversity inclusion of women that increases the productivity which increases if it's a private company which increases the profit and as a result more money is available and that increases the wages of all the employees of the organization so in other words there is a case where the empowerment and, and participation of women at all the level is not only helpful to the women but to the overall organization overall so overall nation building. This is the second point. Uh, <clears throat> the third point, which I would like to uh, uh, again to uh, to tell, is that if you look at the data of last 15 years, uh, especially I look into two boxes as a as a Department of Biotechnology person. One is the 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 education sector, right from primary school to middle school to college to PhD level, and second is the workforce. So you will find that considerable. Uh, increase and improvement has been made into the education sector you know if you look look back about 20 years back the gender parity index or the participation of the girls into the school level was i think 0.9 or 0.8 that means out of 100 we have huge deficit over a period of time that i'm happy to state here that the the last survey the the survey which is done by the ministry of education that is showing that a very healthy uh, participation student at the school college and university level and that is close to one and especially if you look at the higher education sector again you will find that the gross enrollment ratio of the girls and women into the education is again very healthy of course there are certain deficits you know uh, discipline wise team wise still there are gaps which need to be fulfilled however in last 15 years i can say the trend has been very positive now the, the second point uh, in the same uh, Theme, which I wish to sensitize and uh, not only with the government agencies but to the industries but that the concomitant growth or improvement has not been seen into the workforce because if you look at the participation of the women if I look at the data published by the Department of Science and Technology the last one the, the latest the last one I can't remember the, the years but it was 14.7 uh, percent of women into SNT workforce and the latest one is saying 16.5 so that has been a very, you know, like a very, very minimal, you know, improvement. I would be happy if this goes to the 20%, which is the Asian average, or it goes to the 28%, close to 30%, which is the global average. So here is the gap. So the message which I'm taking myself as officer of the DBT, I also wish to remind that we will work hard to promote and to enable, to create the environment so that not only the education in terms of the various uh, fellowships, scholarships, and postdoctoral fellowships, but also create the avenues for women scientists to be absorbed into the uh, workforce system. Once again, I won't take much time because I'm also waiting to listen the women scientists and women achievers from the uh, DBT and from the various uh, you know awards and fellowships uh, who will tell about their own journey. And I would like to take uh, lessons to be learned from them and recommendations suggested by them. So finally, on behalf of the Department of Biotechnology. I wish to reiterate and confirm 
still do our best possible to support all the girls and women at a student level, at a charity level, or all the schemes of the DBT, wherever possible, to provide them support, which we have been doing in the past. But nevertheless, if there are scopes which can be improved, if, if there are certain you know areas, we'll be more than happy to further reinforce and take the journey to the further, so that both the you know whether this SDG goals are achieved and women participation in education as well as into the workforce sector is achieved. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your kind comments. I now request Dr. Rajesh Gopi, Secretary, DBT, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India, to address the action. Thank you, Subira. Uh, uh, thank you, all of you, for, uh, for coming here today on this wonderful occasion. Uh, I first of all extend my wall greetings to all of you on the International Women's Day. I think it's uh, it's one of those days that uh, we all love to celebrate uh, primarily because the way I look at it is because we all our life we are surrounded by women in different capacities and, and all these incredible women actually do such an important role in our life. There is no reason why you can't thank every day but on a special occasion it's even, even bigger and higher so Thank you again, all of you, for making this life such wonderful and gregarious. I'm, I'm, I'm indeed honored and elated to grow with all of you, actually, in my life. And this has been an incredible journey. And I must say, I, uh, it's, it's a wonderful occasion to say that, actually. I think the way I look at it is gender is part of one's identity, actually, right? I mean, I think this is, this is nothing that you can change or something like that. I think what we can change is these gender specific changes should not demarcate boundaries both in societal and cultural or professional ways actually there is no reason why we should demarcate those activities and that's what my real uh, you know motivation in all these is. we should have freedom to way the way everybody wants to work and the way everybody wants to express themselves and carry forward themselves actually i think that's been the most wonderful part uh, of what department of biotechnology has been doing in fact if you look at department of biotechnology history it's one of the unique department where large number of where again two secretaries were women secretaries of the five secretaries in fact have led department of biotechnology from a point of you know in the past several years and they've done it with great finesse and all of us uh, you know would acknowledge that their contributions have been enormous and immense to the growth of so I think it's wonderful to know that we work in an environment where the women are already given lots of, uh, you know, they are the one who are giving us directions and giving powers and giving activities to be able to look at. However, some of the data, as several of you collected, you know, I also looked at Google and other places to try and find some interesting data to look at. And one of the interesting data that I found on the World Bank site was rather interesting, actually. And this said that, the, that about 43% of the women in India, in fact, complete their graduation in STEM areas. And I thought this was rather incredible, actually, if that's the number, which is because that means that there are more and more people who take up to the STEM areas of research, active STEM areas for their graduation. And this is even higher than almost all developed countries. So I got this number saying US has about 34%, UK is about 38%, Germany is 27%, and France 32%. And I think in India, it is about somewhere around 43%. So it's incredible that, you know, people take up to the STEM area of science, technology, engineering, and math, and, and the, uh, in this area of research for their activities of carrying out the future movie. Unfortunately, even though despite this, the number of R&D personnel that works in various posts, about, I think broadly it's about three lakhs or third, people, if you look at from what you look at from an R&D setup in Indian perspective, actually, that work. Unfortunately, the number of people who survive as a long term in the STEM area is still about 15% of them, I think. And I think this is something that we, is a very worrisome factor for a, for a, from an administrative point of view or from a point of view of the way we look at gender balance in our society and system, I think. And I think that clearly need to be corrected and that clearly need to be looked at and why is it that scenario happens actually and is it there therefore how do we correct it and i think that's what department of biotechnology as dr sanjay mitra and dr raksha divan both mentioned is that in fact it has several programs that are uh, that are associated specifically for to bring people to, to be able to get back if they have breaks in the in their careers how to bring them back again and re-energize and refocus and re-get 
get back into their own uh, own values of what one can look at actually and obviously there are other programs that one has to do this at this at the school level at the college level at the entry level and clearly we need to bring out more and more motivational uh, aspects of lives that actually get get some of these people to do well uh, together in fact if you look at sports is one of the area where women sports people personals have been actually doing better than men counterpart in almost all disciplines of 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 sports if you look at liver part cricket which has a long, long history and that cricket history is still very small but they nonetheless they were also you know semi final they were they were in the final last year of the world cup 2020 as well so clearly you know there's a tremendous amount of environment that one should actually feel excited about being part of this ecosystem and be able to carry out actually so i think let me first uh, let me just say that you know uh, i i think what what department has uh, decided to do in fact to be able to you know carry forward the these some of these fellowships and awards that are being granted is to double their numbers from this year onwards and i'm really thankful for all my colleagues to be able to do this i think this is both for janki amal fellowships for young women as well as for the senior women actually and we would also enhance their fellowship uh, amounts that 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 we will provide them to carry or carry forward their work so hopefully this is a small small way but i think it will keep changing and if we keep moving ahead as keep as more and more money flows into the department actually we will continue to empower and carry forward these activities so this is a small i i understand this is small for the total size of the country but there's always a beginning to be able to make and be able to carry forward actually finally i really want to again acknowledge all the past and present women uh, people in department of biotechnology because that's where i am present here for and i think uh, the lots of wonderful women and i think i really admire them for their dedication for their commitment and for their all the complete professional ethics that they carry forward to and i have i think they have got tremendously contributed to this department success as i have said again reiterate the two secretaries by themselves have been women in this part of things in this in this activity i think uh, with this i will just stop but i am very looking forward to listening to some wonderful uh, this a small uh, you know a small talk of what themselves and feel about it and you know where are the other possibilities that we all can you know inculcate some good ideas and practices and i really look forward to the six people six of you whom you are going to speak after me and i think i'll be uh, i'll just stop here but say thank you very much again and this is very very important uh, for us that uh, we actually celebrate successes of people actually in variety of forms and i think thank you very much again for coming and thank you dr salunke for hosting this uh, today's meeting it's a very very uh, important activity that you are doing over there and i I'm really grateful from department of biotechnology is grateful for this activity thank you thank you sir for your kind words and thanks uh, we now move to the talks from women researchers our first speaker is professor rita mehkar professor rita's area of specialization is in oncology she is professor and scientific officer retired hobi baba national institute and actor pmc mumbai presently director of samarth kurba life science private limited for the kind introduction and i would like to first of all wish all of you a very happy international women's day um can i have my slides i think i sent my slides to you can you uh, project them please yes sir yeah thank you so uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, uh, dr suraksha divan for inviting me and congrats i'd like to congratulate her for holding this um, half day uh, event on international women's day Uh, next slide please so uh, very often i am asked how was i motivated to be a scientist and when i think back i think i was just fortunate to be born in a family where uh, women were um, encouraged to uh, take up challenging uh, uh, activities and to pursue uh, a career in science or a career 
and I was really very fortunate to have two of my um, grandfather's sisters who were uh, highly qualified in those days. Both of them had traveled abroad. One of them had gone to UK to get an MRCOG degree, and the other one was in Edinburgh doing a PhD under a very famous uh, embryologist, Dr. W. H. Waddington. Uh, and uh, so they were like role models for me. Also, my mother was one of the first uh, lady pilots to get a private pilot's license. And all this was in the late 40s, early 50s, remember, when women were not even allowed to get out of their house. So this was something that probably led me to um, pursue a career in science. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. So after doing my PhD, I was selected in a UNDP UNESCO course in modern biology at a Biological Research Center in Zeged, Hungary. And there I was fortunate to learn the then latest technology of hybridoma uh, uh, making monoclonal antibodies. And that was the time when uh, uh, Kohler and Milstein had just got the Nobel Prize for uh, this uh, hybridoma technology. Later, when I returned to India, after those two years in Hungary, I joined Cancer Research Institute. And uh, I helped Dr. Damayan Tisha at the Radiation Medicine Center to make monoclonal antibodies against thyroglobulin. And this was again in the early um, 80s. So, you know, uh, things were very different at that time. We didn't have any, we had to do everything manually and handle so many 96 well plates, nurture the cells, screen the supernatals for antibodies. And uh, so for all this, you know, it took a lot of time. I don't think I spent a single weekend at home. I was always in the lab. Then I worked at Actric, which is uh, what is earlier called as Cancer Research Institute for more than 35 years. I was again fortunate to work with Dr. M.G. Deo, who encouraged me to initiate projects in futuristic medicine, such as gene therapy. I, uh, and you know, this was 30 years ago when uh, people in India hardly uh, worked on gene therapy. And in fact, uh, some of my senior colleagues tried to dissuade me. They said, why do you want to do gene therapy? This is something that's going to be so expensive that no one in India will be able to afford it. But you know, the picture has changed completely now. I also made a transitive mouse expressing a gene ectopically in the skin. Again, I was sent for training to US by Dr. Day and when I came back, this was again in the late 90s that he made the most first transgenic mouse here. After superannuation, I joined a startup company and I'm now working on cell therapy for patients with back pain due to herniated intervertebral disc. And uh, we hope to do clinical trials soon. Next slide, please. Okay, so we know that women face several challenges in professional development. Women are constantly striving to uh, come out into their traditional homemaker and mother roles to professional career woman roles. And some of my friends and colleagues have really managed to do this very successfully, and they manage both fronts very well. So, um, you know, this should not deter any of the young um, upcoming women scientists. However, we know that pregnancy and related ramifications are still primarily women's concerns in some cultures, and continue to slow down the growth of many women professionals, in addition to the other societal perceptions in India. In fact, I remember I had a very bright young girl who joined my group uh, for a PhD program, and I was really happy that she had joined me. She was a really intelligent girl. But soon after she got uh, she uh, joined, she got married, and I had no problems with that. But she had a uh, tough time uh, handling both situations. Some other in law would want her to go for all the religious uh, uh, ceremonies everywhere, every day, and she hardly gave any importance to the research that this young girl was doing. So unfortunately, the girl had to quit her PhD uh, uh, program. So constant attempts are going to steadily improve the gender climate in several aspects. And there is an increasing number of medical graduates and scientists who've done really well. Uh, and we know there are two examples from DBT. We know Dr. Manju Sharma and Dr. Uh, Renu Swaroop, who reached the top position of power at the Department of Biotechnology. So. Um, even then, I think women have to be at least 10 times better than the men to reach such positions of leadership. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Single-mindedly uh, pursuing a career is easier for men, definitely, than for women. 
as evidenced by the pattern of work and working hours, time spent on domestic family chores, and conference attendance rates of male versus women. Pregnancy and maternity leave are still viewed with much bias by most employers. Women have to walk a tight rope to balance family, clinical care, and research pursuits, in addition to maintaining and advancing professional skills. For efforts like fellowship and mentorship options, support for women after maternity leave, both flexibility in education programs and accessibility, accessible care development, skill development programs, and leadership workshops is the need of the hour. Better child care facilities at workplace and conference venues are considered helpful for advancing women's careers. So, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we know we've just heard about some of the initiatives that uh, DBT has taken for um, uh, to encourage women to return to their career after a break. Uh, in addition, there is the Women Scientists Team WOSA, which is uh, from the Department of Science and Technology, and the Kiran Scheme uh, from the uh, Department of Science and Technology, and of course, BioCare, which is what is holding this uh, meeting. Next slide, please. So I would like to end with this, these words from one of the uh, most admired women scientists who has got two Nobel uh, Prizes, uh, Madame Marie Curie, who said that life is not easy for any of us. But what of that? We must have perseverance and above all confidence in ourselves. We must believe that we are gifted for something and that this thing at whatever cost must be attained. So, all the young um, women scientists in the uh, audience, I must tell you that you must persevere and have confidence in yourself and you will be successful. Thank you. I'm done. So thanks a lot uh, to uh, DBT as well as ICJP for giving me opportunity to talk on uh, this wonderful occasion that is International Women's Day. So I congratulate you all for organi organizing such a beautiful function. And uh, I would like to uh, share a few of my slides. Uh, I'll show you the work I have been doing at NIPHR for the past uh, uh, 16 years and uh, what brings me here on this platform. So I'll just share my screen and uh, show the work I have been pursuing. Uh, so can you uh, see my slide? Uh, Dr. Ashwarya, we can see your slide. You need to put it in projection mode, please. Problem uh, projecting it in the projection mode. Yeah, can you see? Yes, please. Uh, so uh, basically, what I do at NIPGR is to study uh, how does sugar signaling it controls uh, plant growth development and uh, stress responses. So sugar, as we all know, it is produced by photosynthesis, and once it is produced, it not only acts as a source of energy, but it can also act as a signaling molecule. So in my lab, uh, I have been trying to decipher uh, how does sugar acting as energy or, the, or a signaling molecule control plant growth development as well as the stress responses. So sugars once produced, uh, they can either be perceived by hexavalence dependent signaling, independent signaling, or they can be perceived by uh, two kinases, which are very, uh, two important kinases. One of them is tor kinase, which promotes growth and development when there is ample energy in the system. 
but when the energy is less and the plant is stressed then smr kinases they get activated and what they do is to block tor kinases and they block growth and development and they induce stress responses so uh, when i joined nipgr there was hardly uh, anything known about how does uh, sugar it regulate plant growth and development so i did very very basic fundamental work and i tried to understand how does presence of glucose affects various uh, growth parameters in the plant so i put the plants in various growth conditions and i could actually see that uh, glucose profoundly affects plant growth and development not only in terms of uh, root length lateral root formation root hair formation but surprisingly surpri surprisingly also the gravitropic responses so glucose could alter all the responses so uh, then i uh, thought maybe glucose does it via altering some of the hormonal responses because all these responses all these features are also uh, governed by several hormones for that i conducted several experiments uh, in terms of like physiology molecular biology cell biology and i could figure out that glucose interacts with various hormones such as resnestroid for controlling the directional growth or uh, with cytokinin to control the root hopping response so they were very very beautiful responses in which glucose and hormones they could interact with each other so later on we also figured out that glucose also controls the number of lateral roots as well as their angles angle of emergence so these are two very very important uh, features which decides the root architecture and which in turn decide uh, how much plant or the nutrients will be absorbed because a better root architecture makes the plant uh, sustainable in terms of growth and development while a poor architecture uh, it doesn't help the plant and uh, it is not uh, conducive for the growth and development or to encounter and survive the stressful condition so uh, this is the project that i got uh, to my national women biosense grant so this was about interaction between glucose and salicylic acid signaling and in this project what we could see is that well the glucose could prom promote the root uh, growth self as it antagonizes glucose inhibits the root growth they promote the stress responses and finally we, we could uh, see uh, at the molecular biology level that happens because glucose and salicylic acid they antagonistically regulate some of the cell cycle related genes so these are all cell cycle related genes which are anti antagonistically regulated by glucose and salicylic acid and so is the uh, cell cycle or the cell division so we have proposed a model wherein uh, glucose and salicylic acid by controlling a common set of genes they antagonistically regulate each other apart from uh, studying the effect of sugars on uh, root growth we have also looked at the hypothalamic growth response and there are some of the very important parameters which the interaction of the two controls one of them is the hypothalamic land and another is very very beautiful as you can see in this picture the hypothalamic gravitropism is uh, it is uh, greatly influenced uh, in the presence of hormones and the glucose in the presence of resnestroid which is a plant hormone the hypothalamus they, lo they lose their gravitropic response while in the presence of glucose they just restore it so that means glucose gives them the ability and tells them that you are a stem and then you have to move against the gravity so these are some of the beautiful fundamental features we have been able to explore by using electroxys as a model system apart from the growth and developmental responses we have also figured that the presence of sugars they can give plants a memory a, 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 an ability to remember things just like human beings so this is a very beautiful experiment where we could show that when the plants are challenged with the high temperature or the lethal, lethal temperature then they just simply die whether they are present in 0% glucose medium or 3% glucose medium when, but when these plants they are given progressive stress that means first they are challenged with a lower stress or lower amount of stress and then they are challenged with lethal stress then we could find that in presence of glucose they could survive they could remember that they were previously challenged with a, a similar stress and they have start generated certain kind of a memory so that they could better tolerate the lethal stress and they could survive when they were grown in the glucose containing medium we figured out the mechanism and we could actually show that the presence of uh, there, there was some presence of epigenetic marks such as histone uh, trimethylation marks on the histone of uh, some heat stress memory gene and because of these marks these heat stress memory genes they could show a sustained expression even after the stress was withdrawn 
So because of the higher expression of these heat stress memory gene at a later time point gives the plant an ability to survive the uh, heat stress better. So uh, apart from this, we were also interested in understanding why does there is such a big overlap between the glucose and the hormones in controlling so many growth and development and stress responses. And we carried out several uh, microarray experiments or the whole genome experiments to find out is there an overlap between the two signal transduction? And we could actually see that there is a huge overlap, almost 62% of the gene in terms of uh, the gene expression they were commonly regulated by the sugars as well as the hormones. We started to characterize a few genes so as to find the nodal, uh, uh, nodal molecular uh, factors which, which, which uh, lie both beneath the uh, glucose signal transduction as well as the hormone signal transduction. So we picked up one of the genes which was expressed very highly in presence of glucose as well as in presence of uh, oxygen and we started to characterize it because this gene uh, even though it was expressed protein, its function was not known and it just contained one domain which was domain of unknown function. So it made us all the more interested in this gene and later on found that this gene is very very similar to some of the zinc finger assays containing protein. So we named these genes as FLJ and to our surprise almost all the members of this gene family they could interact with SNRK. I will reiterate here again that SNRK is the protein which gets induced when the plant faces stress and when there is very less energy available to the plant. So uh, we started to look for the phenotype of for these mutants and we found that the mutant phenotypes look as if they are constantly under challenge. This is my wild type plant, these are the mutant plants and they look as if there is less energy or as if they have more, more SNRK all the time. So we looked at the SNRK levels and we actually found not only the level of SNRK was high, but also the activity of SNRK was very high in these mutants. And as I told you, whenever SNRK is more, it stops the activity of TOR kinase. We could actually see that yes, the activity of TOR kinase is, uh, was very, very uh, low in these plants. Uh, since these uh, genes, they were also affected by several of the stresses. We looked for the stress response of these mutants and we found that they were resistant to stress. So we had proposed a model that uh, this gene family member, it acts as a, uh, it maintains a balance between the activity of SNRK and TOR kinases and it helps the uh, SNRK and TOR to decide whether the plant has to follow a growth and developmental pathway or it has to go for a stress response pathway. So they are the regulator of master regulators in the plant. So basically the conclusion uh, of my work which I have done till now is that a role of sugars, a role of glucose and its interaction with plant hormones, it is very very important for controlling seeding growth and development and we have also figured out novel signaling regulators of uh, sugar signaling and which can be modulated and which can be changed in such a way that uh, the stress responses of the plants can be regulated and these findings can be used uh, from the prospects of biotechnological point of view. So uh, as uh, uh, I was requested that I should uh, uh, let you know about the contribution of Janki Amal Award on my career. So I would say this was the first recognition which was best of upon me. And before that, I didn't win any awards, even though I applied for so many of them. So I was first recognized by this award in 2015. And once I got this award, and then there was, uh, I, I got recognized from various academy, I was recognized by JC Bo's uh, um, fellowship. So I would say that that was the starting point that gave me a recognition in the scientific community. So it really helped with my career. It helped me with better networking. As the previous speaker said, the women they get less opportunity because of their dual responsibility to network, to attend conferences, and to uh, interact with the fellows, with the peers. But once you are recognized, it's very easy to make a mark and to network with other people. And uh, uh, it is uh, very important to say that it give me financial capability to run the lab smoothly for the last five years and these years had been really really very tough uh, because of the corona we didn't have like the grant release in time and all but because of this grant I could use this money to support my students who were in the final year of their PhD so I, I could give them SRI fellowship so that they can complete their work and they could they can uh, they can work in my lab till they get a postdoctoral opportunity. 
So that way, uh, the grant had been really good for me. Uh, it would, with the grant, I could sustain my lab for the past uh, for the past five years. And uh, not to mention the personal award money, because we all have ambitions. We all have, uh, you know, we think uh, in terms of like what can we do more for our kids and family. And with the personal award money, uh, of course, uh, we can definitely do a lot. So, th uh, so thank you so much, TVT, for giving me this award. And uh, with this, I would like to acknowledge all my students, all my colleagues who have helped me to reach the place I have been. And I thank uh, NIPGR, DVD, and DSD for giving me the grant and the support and the encouragement. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So I'll be happy to answer any question if uh, there are any. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, introduction. Uh, so, uh, that's okay, that's okay, absolutely okay. Yeah, I'll let Can I share my screen, please? Yes, I'll just make it this. Yes, I'll just make it I did try and it said you cannot. So oh, okay. let me just see. <laughs> let me just see. Uh -huh. um, Please put your slides on uh, this top yeah. of the screen, please. Full okay. So is it visible? I yes, think. please. Uh, thank you so much for having me here and very warm wishes and greetings on the occasion of International Women's Day to all. Um, of us here and uh, all over the world, possibly. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking here on this occasion. And I am also feel very honored to be one of the recipient of Janki Amal National Women Bioscientist Award. So today I'm going to share uh, about uh, what this, this, this award recognized in my lab. And uh, it has been a tremendous encouragement uh, to our lab especially in trying to explore a new area which uh, we had not earlier started uh, related to mycobacteria and HIV co-infection. So my laboratory has been working on two human pathogens, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis the TB causing bacteria and human immunodeficiency viruses. But this award was a recognition uh, given to us uh, for our work that we initiated on understanding HIV mycobacteria co-infection biology and also for developing a very simplistic lab model that permitted us to uh, support high throughput investigations uh, uh, to identify new uh, drugs, new targets, especially for, uh, you know, very customized for uh, co-infection conditions. So uh, without uh, just trying to Give a perspective, tuberculosis and HIV we know is a global health problem and TB is the most common infection which uh, constitutes 60% of the mortality under the co-infection stage and the reason possibly is that the very immune cells which are responsible for containment of TB are the ones which are under attack in HIV patients. India has a concern because it has highest number of both the kinds of diseases and uh, very, very recently has been uh, in a very wrong list of the top 20 uh, uh, countries which have which had this 
uh, you know, looming problem of co-infection, MDR-TB, along uh, in both uh, the tuberculosis as well as in HIV co-infected patients. So these co-infections are a concern not only for mycobacterial pathogenic mycobacteria, but uh, during our uh, research as well as others have noted that there are a lot of non tuberculosis mycobacteria and environmental mycobacteria, which otherwise are seemingly harmless, can also co-infect my uh, HIV patients. Concerns are that they remain asymptomatic, they cannot be treated by conventional TB, overburden on cytotoxicity of the drug is a concern, and that actually prompted us to look into, that we have to look into the co-infection biology in order to find out that if we have very specific target for co-infection, especially in the context of uh, mycobacteria in HIV patients. So we started our studies uh, uh, with uh, the field uh, observations uh, spanning around 250 um, uh, you know, subjects and for the first time uh, kind of proposed that there is a huge discordance that we generally uh, see in CD4 T cell levels with the viral load and proposed that non-correlation of CD4 T cell levels and viral load in the co-infection background possibly should be taken uh, very seriously because we cannot use these parameters for scoring the disease progression. Not only that, we also kind of, this, uh, this field observation led to, uh, you know, certain immune uh, uh, markers or immune uh, uh, pointers that whenever that can, that, can, that can give us some understanding about what is the possibility of increased susceptibility to hyperinflammation when there is a co-infection case or there can be a possibility of relapse associated with the HIV cases. Also, we have noticed that there is a huge prevalence of atypical mycobacteria, environmental mycobacteria. All this prompted us that if we require to do a very high-end cell, uh, you know, understand the cell biology, molecular biology event, we require to have a more simplistic model. And uh, we try to take these, all these observations from the field to generate a field compliant cell culture-based model, which will mimic uh, the readouts from the field. So this model uh, uh, was based on the cell culture of micro macrophages, and uh, we made a model where uh, HIV background gets a secondary infection of a mycobacteria. The model was validated not only, the model can be used not only for pathogenic mycobacteria, but it has been validated for clinically relevant opportunistic mycobacteria that exhibited increased persistence during co-infection together with increasing HIV status and has been uh, uh, glad to, glad to uh, uh, recognize that it has been used in, in certain modified uh, form or uh, directly by several labs across the world. With the hypothesis that uh, if we, the cellular environment, which actually is uh, the host environment, is nothing but an expression of, can be an expression of differential mycobacterial uh, uh, proteome that is um, you know, uh, expressed during the co-infection stage, which possibly leads to a very uh, conducive environment for HIV, because of which HIV may be having a better propagation uh, environment. We did a very thorough, uh, uh, so we did this, uh, we used this particular model, isolated and tried to uh, understand the mycobacterial proteome which or the secreted proteins either directly into the cells or within the microenvironment, which where we also noticed that there can be a cell to cell communication through exosomes, cytokines, and many other factors, and tried to understand that. What are the changes that takes place in the host proteome vis-a-vis -vis the intercellular mycobacterial proteome? Uh, we did a very intense, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, dissections of the various pathways and try to focus, try to understand uh, different kind of critical host parameters that are altered during the uh, uh, co-infection to get a background that what is the environment that HIV prefers to uh, live in and uh, you know to, uh, gets a boost in propagation. Uh, propagation. Uh, just to kind of give a glimpse that we found the many of the usual players which actually reinstated and strengthened our, con our confidence in our model where we found that uh, the host environment is uh, compromised for endocytical, endosomal recycling but more important even the cargo degradation. Some unusual players, of course we uh, saw that there are metabolism which is altered but there are very unusual players uh, like carnitine o carnitine transferases, levels of carnitine which had already been reported uh, to be um, uh, conducive for HIV, uh, metabolic rewiring in mitochondria, dysfunction of mitochondria, high energy state, yet there are 
a certain kind of receptors that were upregulated during core infection, which can be used by HIV to have an entry other than the CSTR4 and CCR5, which are commonly known, not to know, uh, not to uh, list the various kind of transcription factors and regulators which are possibly pro HIV activities that could were upregulated during uh, mycobacterial co infection. Uh, the question next definitely was what is happening to the mycobacterial proteome and we did see that mycobacteria also and in, the, in a single infection versus the co-infection have a very different set of proteins to express and also the, our, our, our uh, interest was also in several of the secreted proteins. So we did an analysis on that and uh, also tried to validate those uh, mycobacterial proteins, the impact of those mycobacterial proteins on the persistence and on HIV titers. Uh, using certain mutant bacteria uh, and uh, try to see that whether such kind of factors can have a, uh, have a stay in persistence of mycobacteria itself even during mono infection and what happens to the viral titers when such a when uh, co-infection occurs. Just to give an example, to give a, a perspective, we do see that one of the factors like IDR, which is a global RN dependent transcription regulator, it not only is a very important regulatory factor, but it has a huge network of proteins that it can regulate, which shows that uh, it had an impact on viral titers. So by doing that, we have listed uh, this particular uh, you know, uh, study has given us a platform, a baseline information and a lot of mycobacterial factors and the pathways associated with which are the possible or potential uh, regulators uh, which if we can control, if we can understand, if we can target, possibly can control both the bacterial titers as well as the viral titers during co-infection. To take you just to give an example that what are, how are we taking this study further is uh, the right now we are working with after getting this an enormous baseline information we are working with the hypothesis that mycobacterial proteins that are released either within the uh, within the cell if they are co-infected or within the vicinity of the cells which are maybe independently infected but are influenced by each other due, due to released or secretory factors can happen in two ways. Either the mycobacterial proteins can go and directly interact with the HIV LPR, thereby promoting viral transcription, or they can also influence the host and make the host very conducive for viral propagation. It can induce certain factors in the host, which it actually are the positive regulator of HIV propagation. One simple example is our earlier observation on co-infection, where we had shown that one of the host factors, which is a zinc finger protein, uh, which is uh, which we established as a positive regulator of HIV-1 LTR. This host factor goes and binds into HIV LTR. We show we have characterized it intensely how the binding takes place. And if you see in the HIV uh, co-infection background, is a tremendous expression of such kind of um, host factor, which the virus can then recruit and propagate. So we come now with this study that there is a mycobacterial factor which is responsible for this and this mycobacterial factor can drive the expression of uh, uh, this protein ZNF1C4 which kind of tells us that while we were observing earlier a tremendous increase in this ZNF1C4 factor in TB patients. So our hypothesis for many such factors that we have listed now is that mycobacterial infection whenever happens alongside HIV results in upregulation of such kind of positive factors like the ZNF1C4, which actually induced, is induced by and are played by mycobacterial factors like MTRA. And they, that results in increased LTR activity and hence the formation of HIV. And therefore, we have high viral load in HIV patients with TB infection. So this can this is this is kind of not only maybe true, maybe indirectly or directly, there are mycobacterial factors that are responsible for it. So towards this, we are trying to uh, you know uh, uh, validate a number of factors, and for all of them, so yet another factor is ESPR again an MTV virulence regulatory factor, which possibly does it to indirectly by regulating the IL-4. We, we try to see, show them that they do migrate to the nucleus to have this effect. They, they, uh, they bind to the promoter region and several kinds of these validations in, in place. So I'll be summarizing the hypothesis that we are working on with the help of uh, uh, in support of this particular program and there are a number of such factors which we feel that are, can be potentially uh, regulated, we have to make to 
uh, make us understand the co-infection biology, where we've seen that there are several factors that we have, under, uh, have identified that are secreted directly into the cell or are in the vicinity. And these cells, these factors, they find their way into the nucleus and we see them in the nucleus. And then these factors, they bind to the LTR of HIV or maybe indirectly, it tends to increase the uh, you know, viral uh, transcription and that results into increased viral titers. So our right now aim is to inhibit all these uh, you know, uh, stages by which we feel that these mycobacterial factors are uh, helping. And if we manage, can manage to inhibit these uh, uh, interactions, these vibrations, or the secretion process, maybe we will be able to restrict the, the viral RNA transcription and resulting in, in controlled viral regulation, even in the co-infection um, uh, background. That may also give us, uh, helps us in designing drug molecules, which can be used in co-infected conditions where, and uh, uh, not uh, controlling the disease progression, which otherwise would take place if it is not controlled in, in my, in during co-infection. Yet another approach is that we have seen that there is a thorough abuse of uh, on mitochondria during the co-infection, and we are uh, um, are in the process of screening and actually have come across some of the small molecules that act improve the mitochondrial health, and we are in the process of trying to see that if such kind of molecule or uh, can be used alongside the uh, therapy that is used for co-infection, whether that will help us in further increase mycobacterial clearance or decrease in the viral titers. So uh, with this, uh, I acknowledge uh, the uh, patients, the clinicians and medical staff, all our collaborators, a number of people helped me in um, uh, arri uh, arriving at where we are, but uh, the recognition through Janaki and one National Women Bioscientist Award has been a tremendous boost uh, in the lab, uh, because it has, uh, we have now a set of, uh, you know, uh, I will call them uh, budding research scholars who are so interested in understanding the co-infection biology uh, that uh, uh, we uh, we believe that at some uh, point of time we will be able to not only understand the co-infection biology, the molecular and cellular event, but take it to a translational uh, level. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and thank you once again Chikiti, for recognizing my work uh, through this award. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shadishi. Uh, we now move to our next speaker, Dr. Lakshmi Basana. She's a biochar body and her project contributed to development of a global chicken enzyme-based technology and consolidates the industrialization of high-end biopesticides and bio products, which should provide technical support to biopesticide industry. The technology pertains to a recombinant chitinase enzyme and is protected by granted patents in US and India. She is now exploring opportunities in industry for tech transfer. Over to you, Dr. Prasanna. Good afternoon, all. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Suraksha Divan and DVT for the invited talk. Um, my biochem project and its research outcome, which led to an enzyme innovation, is focused on the development of. One minute, I'll ju I'll just. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you please uh, help me? You know. Share screen. I'm not able to uh, share the screen. Dr. Lashmi, I've made you the co host. It should allow you to share the screen. There is a green. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Is it visible now? Yes, please. Uh, yes, you can start the search. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my biotech project and its research outcome, which led to an enzyme innovation, is focused on the development of a novel chitinase-based enzyme technology aimed at a breakthrough in integrated pest management for a safe and effective sustainable agricultural practice and other possible industrial applications. But the motivation for the Biocade project proposal is uh, my trust with a new chitinase from a novel strain of Brevibacillus lagrosporus based on the preliminary research carried out at Norwegian University of Life Sciences 
in collaboration with Professor Vincent Epoyne and world expert in Taiwanese research. Biocare funding gave me a powerful opportunity to develop a new proprietary technology and an enzyme innovation in biopesticide and chitinase research driven by UN Sustainable Development Goals with an objective to increase the competitiveness of biotech industry in India and overseas. The primary goal is to improve the sustainability of Indian agriculture industry and contribute to the forestry uh, area. Uh, the problem is most of the currently available biopesticides have been limited to Bacillus thuringiensis and majority of the pests have developed resistance to Bt-based bio-pesticides. So uh, the aim of my research project is uh, to discover and develop new biopesticides with improved stability and efficacy, uh, which will have a reasonable opportunity for being commercially successful with unique benefits that current products in particular BT products lack. So then the solution uh, that the Biocare project aimed at it was at establishing a chitinase based technology transfer platform with the ability of continuous innovation for a new generation biopesticides and biocontrol products and possible as a possible alternative to BT. So, so why, why did I choose Brevibacillus lactosporus, so a biological cousin of Bt. So the Brevibacillus lactosporus is a rarely distributed emerging entomopathogenic bacterium. So as I mentioned, it's a biological cousin of Bt and, uh, and uh, Bacillus pericus. So the isolated strain uh, is a hyperchitolytic uh, one and is a rare find. So novel chitinase is a robust and high performance enzyme with significant traits like marked thermostability and alkaline tolerance. And, and the most important and promising research finding is that the chitinase can provide a solution to chitin waste management by effective industrial scale utilization of environmental chitin like waste, marine crustacean shells. shells. Yeah. Uh, so the research premise is the first and foremost uh, goal of the research premise is development of an integrated research platform for a novel proprietary technology, um, mainly for biological control. But when I was performing my experiments, I could just uh, find out that it has many potential industrial applications in the areas of bioremediation, biofuels, etc. And uh, so the titan waste management can lead to the enzymatic production of value-added products, so like uh, N-acetyl glucosamine and D-acetyl glucosamine, which have highly medicinal uh, value. And uh, so I have just listed out like a few unique characteristics of this chitinase. Mm. So like as I mentioned, it's like alkaline tolerant and which uh, is active over a broad pH range, 3 to 11, and the optimum pH is 9. Uh, and it is thermoactive. So again, it has a dual activity and uh, the exochitinase acts at 5 to 55 degrees centigrade and the endochitinase activity is, was exhibited at 65. So, and, the, and the, it's highly thermostable uh, with a range of uh, like 70 degrees centigrade. And uh, it's an extra cellular chitinase which has high affinity to natural substrates like uh, shrimp shells and crab shells. So a recombinant chitinase is secreted into the extracellular medium, uh, making it suitable for large scale production required for all the uh, industrial applications. So uh, I could devise a novel purification protocol uh, using powdered crustacean cells, making the large scale purification strategy very simple and effective. Mm, and uh, and then la uh, lastly, uh, the dual activity of the chitinase makes it very efficacious uh, and uh, uh, it's, it, it has a lot of uh, benefits over Bt pesticides because it can be used as a contact and in in ingestion biopesticide as well. And uh, just to share this, uh, Novozymes is a global leader uh, 
in enzyme research and uh, they have announced uh, in 2000 early 2021 uh, uh, the collaboration with in collaboration with uh, fmc uh, which is us based agricultural sciences company to work on enzyme based biocontrol technology so i would like to just mention that uh, i have filed my patents uh, in 17 indian patent in 2017 and uh, U.S. patent in uh, 2018, so much before Novozymes ventured into this biocontrol technology. So, I mean, this need to be acknowledged by the scientific fraternity. I've got my granted patents just two, three months ago. Indian patent was granted in uh, December and uh, U.S. patent in November. And uh, so I would like to conclude my talk with uh, just mentioning a few points so um, i ccmb hosted my uh, research work for four years i joined ccmb as a research consultant uh, uh, to support indo-australian project on lipases uh, and then i continued with my biocare project so um, we i'm an army wife who had uh, career breaks because i was into work-life balance so when since I have I'm very passionate about contributing uh, to research. So whenever I, I got an opportunity, so I could work and contribute and try to be productive. So now uh, I'm just trying to seek technology mentorship uh, and then now uh, seeking grant funding also. And I'm trying to build partnerships with the help of Virac, DVT, and uh, BCIL for scaling and refining the technology and uh, for the technology transfer to different companies so i could uh, list and uh, the i could identify and list the companies and share it with bcl and Virac. so i will take it forward uh, from there so i need to understand the landscape to foster the in in innovation target market and uh, when, uh, customer segment so and i also need to collaborate with technical uh, expertise to continue innovating and finding new applications so probably I would come back to DBT uh, for the, some kind of support, uh, either this grant or like because I don't have a permanent position, so I need to associate with an academic institute, or an academic lab, or uh, an industry, and then uh, would like to develop the uh, product. And uh, I deeply acknowledge the support. Uh, extended to me uh, by Dr. Suraksha Divan, Dr. Renu Swarup, Dr. Nitin Jain, Dr. S.R. Rao from DBT, and uh, my uh, the present and past directors of CCMB, and Dr. Achana from IP Group, and my group leader in particular, Dr. Madhusudan Rao, uh, and uh, all my lab mates uh, for all the learning and fulfilling experience to make this work. Thank you all. Any questions? We don't have any questions right now. Thank you uh, for your talk, Dr. Sana. Uh, we now move to the next speaker, who is Dr. Anjan Sudhan. She is a biotech awardee, and her final research was on quantitative tissue proteomics of oral tongue squamous cell carcinoma for novel biomarker discovery. She was a faculty at Ayurveda Cancer Institute, Chennai. In recently and has founded a company, Twin Biocare Technology, where she is also the CEO. She is also director of Saral Biosciences Research Institute. She is passionate about her new endeavor and she has been working with medical students, undergraduates, postgraduates, PhD students to mentor them and provide them with technical guidance. Dr. Anand. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, but I couldn't share my screen. Yeah. Is it visible now? Uh, can you put it in the uh, slideshow mode, please? Yes, this is fine. Okay. Thank you. 
thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity to present about myself and my company, my biofair grant and the contributions. So myself, so oh, uh, I am after I, my master's money. I've been a uh, hospital scholar in Madhuri Kamaraj University, where I pursued my postdoctoral studies with proteomic technology. And further with that, uh, I, I was uh, trying to explore more. So I want to move on with different field of expertise. So I moved with the IID Madras, IID Institute of Technology Madras, for my pool. Whereas in that period only, I got this. BT Biocare Award for an, uh, and with that grant, I was able to move to Ariad Cancer Institute as I want to lead up more number of cancer samples. So my career started as a microbiologist and landed as a faculty in Ariad Cancer Institute. For this transition, BT Biocare Award was a really a great milestone. With that thing, I want to do more. So I just quit my uh, faculty job and I landed in creating my own company. So I'm leading now two different biotechnology research companies. If you words about the grant what I obtained from being especially uh, tongue cancer. The need for the study was when we look into the literatures, you are not having much reports with Indian populations and there was always an uh, uh, devastating about this oral cancer as it has been diagnosed in a very late stage and we need emerging markers which can tell us the condition of the patient in very early stage. That is the only option where we can save lives. So with that, uh, information. I just started my hazard approaches using uh, 2D dye electrophoresis coupled with mass spectrometry to identify the markers. Not only identifying, I want to characterize and I want to validate them with more number of samples. And ultimate aim of this project is to create an, a very easily available assays using salivary samples where we can diagnose the cancer patient in the early, early stage rather than picking them in a very late stage. This is just an information what I tried with the samples and this is an image describing the uh, differential gel electrophoresis using a one gel for comparing both normal tissues as well as the tumor tissues and with this we are able to identify both 122 differentially regulated spots and the marked region shows you the clear difference from the same patient normal tissue was adjacent normal and the tumor tissues and this technology was able to pick up most number of differential regulated protein spots. With that, we did multiple genontology analysis and multiple genontology assays to find the novel markers which are very specific to our Indian population setup. And we derived with about 24 candidate markers which were having a significant differential regulation. And apart from identification of discovery phase, we went for validation phase using QRT-PCR. And we found the similar trend happening in RT-PCR level, like expression level also in mRNA level. So we uh, carry forward with this 24 markers for further analysis of our work. As I was mentioning earlier itself, we need markers specific to Indian population setup because it is not the same. So we can't use the markers which has been already available with the Western population. For to confirm this uh, aspect of concept, we did a bioexpress analysis where we took the data which is already available with Western population and compared with the data of our uh, Indian population setup, what I have presented, and we found six genes to be having strong negative correlations, which means these markers are totally different and unique to our own Indian setup. So, we need Indian biomarker based uh, studies to have a better treatment option with respect to cancer discovery and cancer drug discovery aspects. So, apart from QRT PCR validation, I went for IAC analysis as well. Uh, in this, we have done about more than 10 markers with different uh, stages of infection, uh, different stages of cancer. Starting from zero to hope stage, and we found all these markers have an unique character, which is being having highly upregulation, unique cancer progression. And apart from this, we took four markers based on the proteomic study, RT PCR, IAC validation, and we went for salivary ELISA. So we took the salivary samples from normal patients, like normal uh, healthy volunteers, and we took from an IV going for a cancer stage, and we took for cancer samples as such. So we want to evaluate all these markers pattern, how it's being picked up in a very early stage. 
and we found that certain markers like lemon and other proteins have a capability to be picked up in a very advanced, uh, like a very early stage than going for an advanced cancer progression. So with that, to summarize about the work, what I did with uh, particularly with the bipad support is the, this is the first study to use this 2D dye technology using an Indian patient sample, especially tongue cancer, because we have more exposed to other cancers apart from tongue cancer. So they were able to identify novel markers which are specific to Indian population. And not only identification, we went for a validation as stopping with that, we aim for an assay development with especially salivary samples. And we have both uh, identified all these four candidates like Lemantin, S100, A11, Cystatin B and Galactin 7 are being highly promising, which can be used further as a uh, marker to detect this uh, cancer in a very early stage. And I've been in process of continuing this study in with other collaborations mm -hmm. as well, though my wiper funding is complete. Yeah. I have taken these basic uh, information. I'm trying to do a technology transfer with other uh, companies where we do the strip development. The specific points I want to mention about DBT in my career, it helped me to develop multiple networking and it gives a first scientific recognition as an independent researcher and on the whole it influenced me a lot so I had my company named Clean Biocare okay, because of this biocare thing, I was being uh, recognized in multiple levels. So the, on the whole it gave confidence to start my own company and uh, APG sir is always my uh, inspiration from during our having the uh, discussions and he is the one made me sit back in India and think about in Indian problems and Indian aspects. So all these things made me start my own company. And in my own company in my own native so because i am from very much down knowledge in other things so i have started this company to help my own native people who are very here especially girls and i've been having my own uh, uh, students here be employed and we have been taking them in multiple number of phd works as well so with this few words about the company what i've been working with so we work with cancer biology microbiology marine biotechnology human diseases plant biotech and reproductive biology and especially we focus with the more student aspects rather with more of these other projects and to connect the gap between the merging with the academic things so that it can be translationally converted to patients who are in need of this biotechnology requirements. So these are few of our uh, recent uh, activities which I've been doing with multiple people and these are our few clients already being touched with CBT. And thank you for giving me the wonderful opportunity. I welcome you all to uh, such a company. It's about 3,000 square feet company where you are getting employment and you are being trained and you are giving multiple research aspect projects. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Anandji. We now move to uh, the last speaker in the series, but by no means the least. Uh, she is Dr. Bushra Anandji. She is an ass associate professor at IIT Kanpur, uh, and her research interest involves exploration of genetic and epigenetic changes that initiate cancer and age progression. Apart from many other awards, she, is, uh, she holds the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance Senior Fellowship 2020. She was also awarded Ramanandran National Bioscience Award for Career Development from DBT 2020 and Shanti Swarup Bhattnagar Prize 2020. She has been recently named among the 75 under 50 scientists shaping today's India in a companion issued by the SC Government of India. She will be taking us through her scientific journey today. Dr. Bushra. Yeah, thanks, Savira. Like, can you please make me host? Yes, I'm just doing that. So uh, thanks to uh, DBT and ICGB. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Vira. So yeah, I'm really like uh, indebted to DBT and ICGB for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk at on this event, and especially to Dr. Devan and uh, Dr. Dhu. Uh, so I was told to uh, talk about my journey. 
And uh, my philosophy about uh, journey is, uh, if opportunity does not knock, build your own door in, in brief. So uh, I belong to a small town, uh, Bareilly, and I did my uh, high school from there. And after that, I was admitted to Aligarh Muslim University uh, for my senior secondary school. And I pretty much finished my entire education there. So I did my uh, SSC and BSc, MSc, and PhD in genetic toxicology from the same institution. Since my uh, PhD work was more focused on genetic toxicology, it's more about like studying the effect of herbicides and sites on uh, uh, like, you know, fish uh, or aquatic animals. So uh, I used to read a lot like uh, IRC uh, monographs and that like incited like interest to do uh, like, you know, cancer biology because most of these uh, chemicals, they have uh, like, you know, some oncogenic effect, they are mutagens, some are like potential uh, to be a carcinogen. So with that uh, dream, I moved to New Delhi and joined Dr. Neeta Singh's lab at Ames uh, in Department of Biochemistry. And there I started working on a DBT funded project that was on uh, identifying uh, some uh, like, you know, oncogenes in lung adenocarcinoma. And subsequently, I also received CSIR research district fellowship and I moved to NII. And uh, with that brief stint, I received another fellowship that was like a, like a, a training research grant from Canadian Health Institute. And uh, that exposed me to more of a cancer biology in prostate cancer, breast cancer. And I studied their epigenetic uh, alteration in these uh, cancer types. At that time, that was a time like around 2000 and uh, like, you know, uh, 2007 and 2008, that was a time where like more and more people are moving towards like from microarray to next generation sequencing. So with that, uh, like, you know, hope that I want to learn more about NGS or cancer genomics, I moved to University of Michigan and there I was like, uh, uh, like I had a couple of fellowships, including Genentech postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, so that stay was like a little bit longer. And uh, the, at the same place, I also served as a research investigator for almost for one and a half year. And around 2012, I decided to move back to India because I thought I had enough of uh, like, you know, training as a postdoc. And uh, I was fortunate to get the fellowship, intermediate uh, uh, fellowship from uh, like DBT, India Alliance, that time it used to be like DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance. So uh, uh, so I got fellowship first and then I got the job uh, like, you know, uh, at IIT Kanpur and I established my own laboratory in 2013 and currently I'm a senior fellow there. So the, my group focuses on mainly on cancer biology and other aspects of cancer, including cancer genomics. So uh, again, uh, why I'm in this field, uh, one of the reasons is it gives me freedom to do uh, like you know to do the work I want to do or choose a problem of my choice beside that uh, it create a lifelong impact on the people who work with me especially my students my mentee so as a child I was a curious child and most of the time like I used to like catch butterflies and watch fireflies catch them put in a bottle do all sort of like weird stuff so always like the thing is why it's happening the question is to ask like okay why they glow it like you know at night so with that, like there was a scientific uh, acumen in the background, and uh, with this, like I developed interest in biology and other sciences. And uh, after doing my twelfth, uh, like you know, SSC, I decided to go for uh, like you know, uh, as usual for a PCP student. Like the dream is to become a doctor, so I decided to become a physician. And some of the traits that really like you know uh, impressed me was like how empathetic and how confident they are, like they're going to cure the diseases. But unfortunately, I could not uh, get through that. I don't want to be a like you know a, like a, a person who will work on the BDS or like more of a like you know dentist. So I decided to like uh, move on with my higher education. After BSc, again I started to think like what I want to do. Then I thought like okay, with all the patriotism, I decided to become an Air Force officer. And that time uh, I went to uh, this place like uh, Varanasi. They have like. Uh, short service uh, like you know uh, board like a, it's, a, it's a small air force base so i qualified written exam there but again uh, i failed in their uh, like you know physical test that is like monkey crawling and the rope climbing i failed so again like because science was my passion i moved on i said okay i'll do my like you know higher studies i went to uh, do on phd but if you look like most of the trades in these things whether it's a physician or like an air force officer is there so i decided to become a scientist when i started my uh, phd so currently my uh, lab focuses on like my group focuses on understanding 
uh, how like what initiate cancer and how it progresses, how it moves to other parts of the body, what we can do to control it. So in, in, in a nutshell, like that's what we do. So pretty much uh, like other, other important aspect of being like, you know, uh, in this position is still I retain my uh, this curious uh, childlike attitude. So again, I can, uh, I'm going to ask these questions, but in a different way, like in a more mature way. So uh, again, like, uh, so when I decided to uh, join IIT, like uh, I was having few other offers as well, but then uh, obviously you can think about, like, I want to do biomedical research, I want to work on cancer and joining IIT means like, hey, IITs are known to uh, develop technologies, uh, like uh, we recently even developed like this uh, uh, ventilator and even like oxygen concentrator and robotics. And the big challenge was like, okay, from where I'm going to get clinical samples because for cancer research, I have to do like, you know, uh, if you really want to do, make an impact and take your research to the like, you know, patients uh, you want to have, you want to work with uh, clinical samples. So uh, in one of the meetings, I asked one of my friend who uh, is working in one of the cancer hospitals to help me uh, get the clinical samples. So his answer was like, okay, you move to IT Kanpo, it's very difficult to get clinical samples you better work on cancer cell lines. So uh, to all my like, you know, uh, colleagues or like uh, women or other like, you know, students or whoever is sitting there or listening to this, don't take uh, like, you know, these kind of suggestion, don't take no as an answer. So I started like, you know, exploring this local area and establish a good like, you know, niche of collaborators within Lucknow, Delhi and uh, Kanpur. Now we also have collaborators in, uh, uh, in uh, Tata, like Mumbai. So that was the biggest challenge and then uh, obviously like in India the follow up is not that good so usually you get the patient sample but then what will happen with that patient after 5 years or after 10 years we don't know. So that is very important and then how to like you know uh, team up with the pathologist to get the clinical details. Then other uh, uh, like you know like the, the uh, 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 roadblock was how to get samples in a good condition. So we had to create pretty much our own cold chain, get the portable small liquid nitrogen slender, uh, like uh, uh, slenders careers and get the sample in a good condition. Obviously, like uh, when you want to do cancer biology, immunodeficient mice facility is must. And at that time at IIT Kanpur, there was a mice facility, like a, a temporary, but not the immunodeficient mice facility. So I started from the scratch and it was in the middle of like, you know, nowhere and uh, in a small room I started. And uh, at several occasions, the mice were like <laughs> attacked by a mean cat or a rat, a wild rat, my, uh, rats will injure and they eat up the mice food. So now we have a, a very nice sophisticated five-story building there uh, in the campus and this uh, problem is resolved. Not only that, the IT Kanpur, they decided uh, to start like the School of Medical Research and Technology, SMRT, which is designed, uh, which, which is designed by the HOSPEC, uh, like uh, these are the leaders in setting up the hospitals. So eventually, like, you know, things will pan out once you have a, like, you know, a bill, uh, you know how to, like, you know, if you have perseverance, you know how to, like, chase it and uh, achieve it. So my uh, lab, my group focuses on, uh, like, these cancers. We mainly primarily work on prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and glioblastoma. And we use uh, an array of technology like cancer genomics, uh, uh, fluorescent situ hybridization, and other functional genomics aspect of the uh, cancer biology try to understand the mechanism between, uh, behind the oncogenes and how they evolve and also like we try to look for some of the drugs which may be targeted which could be used for targeting those pathways so in pretty much we ask like what is the molecular mechanism what is the basis of drug resistance in uh, many cancer because many cancer usually they respond to cancer drug or chemotherapeutics which are which have been used and then over a period of time we develop resistance so what is the mechanism of resistance how we could overcome we also uh, 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 use cancer genomics to explore new cancer biomarker and genetic aberration like uh, in Indian uh, uh, cancer code, especially in prostate cancer. And finally, translate all these findings uh, into precision medicine to help patients. So this was the first study, like, so I joined in 2013 and I tried to, like, you know, uh, collaborate with uh, several hospitals around uh, Kanpur. So within Kanpur, we have GSV Hospital. We had collaborators from there, Ames, New Delhi, as well as uh, KGMU, John Medical University, Lucknow, and even a private pathology lab in Gomti Nagar. So Dr. Vinnie Tender, who is on this paper, also, like, collaborated in getting all the sample. And this was the first characterization uh, uh, of the prostate cancer patient from Indian uh, from India and uh, what we found that like uh, pretty much these statins were a little bit different. He impresses to ERB which is a highly recurrent uh, genetic alteration in Caucasian uh, population was also similar 
in Indian population. Beside that, RAF kinase alteration was more. So in Caucasian, is only 2%, whereas in Indian, it was found to be 6%. And uh, so this was the first study to show, like, uh, these are the, like, you know, uh, uh, some of the established alteration prevalent in Indian prostate cancer patients. So currently, uh, what we are doing, we're exploring the uh, mutational landscape of Indian prostate cancer patient. And uh, we have several collaborators, clinical collaborators, as I mentioned, including uh, uh, like uh, Tata at Mumbai. And what we have, uh, from this pilot study, what we did, we sequenced few uh, patients, like, and what, uh, after analyzing the data, the whole exome sequencing data, we found more missense mutations, and the uh, average mutation uh, rate was around 2.37. So usually, uh, like for advanced stage patient, anything more than uh, one is supposed to be like the patient is having much more advanced stage disease, and that is one of the reasons like why we got a little bit higher mutation rate uh, because most of these patients are diagnosed at late stage. So early detection is very important, and this is one very interesting lead that we got from this patient. We found that uh, one patient uh, he uh, had like this uh, CDK12 biallelic uh, inactivation. Uh, bilayelic inactivation of the gene and because of this and uh, this inactivation these mutations uh, are in kinase domain and because of this you see there's a like tandem duplication in, in the entire genome and because of this tandem duplication we see a lot of uh, like you know new antigen so it's known as a new antigenic burden in this patient and this makes this patient patient like you know uh, like much more susceptible to immunotherapy so our lab is our, our group is also working in understanding the pathobiology of ctk12 uh, like you know by a uh, binary inactivated uh, mutation uh, positive patients and what uh, what therapies would be used to benefit these patients now uh, uh, like because today is a very special day so i thought we should put uh, uh, this slide and uh, i'm really uh, like you know uh, indebted to D uh, dst especially like the, this Vigyan Jyoti scheme and uh, it's a wonderful scheme and I'm sure like uh, DBT will also come up with similar uh, strategies. So they provide three, day, uh, three weeks residential camp for the brightest uh, class 11 girls and we had them uh, I think those in 2018 and uh, it's a residential camp and they go to different labs, they uh, like you know, uh, do hands-on experiments, interact with the faculty and the other students. So this was a badge that I entered at that time so you can see how bright and beautiful these girls are like they are like full of like questions and full of like you know enthusiasm and if given the right opportunity i'm sure all these girls will eventually become leaders in their field not only like the women who are there in this picture down here in, uh, in this uh, women in science and engineering conference but they have potential to even become uh, like you know elizabeth blackburn like these nobel laureates or barbara mcintock or mary curie so uh, I think we have to give them like opportunities and encourage them and give them wings to fly. So now I'll end like uh, this is my group, little bit old picture, uh, uh, but I'm like uh, blessed to have such a uh, like you know a motivated and dedicated students uh, uh, here. And uh, not only that, last but not the least, the funding agency, India Alliance, uh, and DBT as uh, SERP, and especially recently I got this SERP Power Grant. And I'll end my talk with this. Uh, quote which I like a lot. So I, our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most threaten us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I think uh, just uh, before we go for the vote of thanks, uh, I think uh, if the audience has any questions, because in between we were not asking uh, because of the time and the other factors. So I wonder if others have any questions, then they can come forward before. And I have just one question to start with uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Ananti uh, <coughs> Sivaganam. Uh, is Dr. Yes, sir. Okay, so just one quick question because uh, before you know the floor is open, is that uh, you started your career with a biocare project in the R and D, and I can see that later on you moved into a startup and you started you know your, your own company. So can you just tell us tell us yes, a little bit more? You know, like uh, not about the science, but about your own mental process, your thought process 
you know, that suddenly uh, you change the course of action of your career from a researcher to an entrepreneur because what has happened, what was thought which was coming into your mind, that is one. And then, uh, you know, like I can imagine being a startup and that to a women startup, then will have a lot more challenges. So can you just give a little bit, one, you know, there's one challenge and how did you overcome that? Yes, sir. Thank you for asking the question, sir. I have faced a lot of challenges in executing this startup and things. But the thought process came because of this DBT biker. I have been uh, uh, noted by many people as a bioproteomic expert. So people started asking me about keen opinions on proteomic technologies and proteomic aspects. And we are not having much people working with this gel-based approaches with mass spectrometry and other things. So when I was helping others, and many people asked me, why don't you start this as a separate service like division, where many will be uh, getting the help from you, and it can be reaching more people. So that is the first point. With the influence of DVD Biocare, I was able to uh, know the uh, lacking area where we can pitch in, and I can use my expertise of this 18 years, where I adapted this technology from my PhD days, and used in my postdoctoral studies, as well as in the, my faculty job. So that is the area I started. And while establishing this uh, startup thing and major uh, investments and other things, uh, it was really a ma major challenge. And exactly when I started this thing, we got Corona as well. So we were having a lot of uh, disappointments and a lot of things, but we were fortunate to sustain the uh, situation. And we were getting people support and we are getting more students coming in from the colleges as they don't have facilities in their own college. And they come up and they were uh, expecting to have hands-on training where I could help them with my small setup when I started. Even I remember when I was starting, I was having only two uh, tables, workbench tables with the one small instrument setup for proteomic technology. And from there, now I have built up about this 3,000 square feet of complete setup with accommodation only for girls. So I, I would like to help more girl students in reaching these, especially in science field. Because I have faced a lot of politics and a lot of uh, downs in my career when I started. So that is the main thing. And main inspiration is to help people with my knowledge, how much I can reach. For that thing, I feel startup is the only thing where you don't have any other domination and where you can work for your dreams and you can run for your dreams and help people in more better way. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. I think uh, anybody else has any question to any of the speakers because so to any one of them and very quick uh, before it comes just to uh, reassure dr bushra Atik, uh, because i'm very happy to see the slide about the vigyan jyoti program which uh, uh, you were showing madam and the, the reason is like I'm, I'm, I'm unable to stop myself because uh, I joined DBT only six months back, and before that, I was head of the career program and the women's science program in DFT. Yes, and in that time, this particular Vigyan Jyoti program was conceptualized. Of course, there was a you know some uh, some seats were there, but actual design, the actions, the planning, and that was done. I very much instrumental in that. So Vigyan Jyoti is one which I'm very happy to see that that has come to your slide. So if you are happy, and I was you know watching the. The, the nearby the uh, this Navodaya Vidyalaya School Kanpur Dehad I was in touch and you know like uh, with their two visits also and I am aware I'm very happy for that part but in addition to that I would like to reassure that not because uh, you know I have moved but you know uh, <clears throat> already DPT has been doing but in the past I have been instrumental in starting this Vigyan Jyoti so the program called uh, Gati G A T I which is again started in coin in my time and third another scheme called mobility scheme for the women which uh, which was again lying for you know under consideration from last i think seven years six years which allowed the permanently employed women scientists who had a regular job in IIT, in universities to have mobility because of factory or personal reason from three to five years so we started that program last year only with two women scientists so idea was to have proof of concept that it runs now from two can become 200 and 2000 later on so I'm happy to reach Thank to you this so much. because you, you, you mentioned about DBTs, so that yes, DBT and L. Okay. DBT is doing a lot, uh, but a like, uh, little bit yeah. more at the grassroots level is also important. DBT is also putting like lot of efforts like biocare and uh, yeah. other like you know uh, uh, like such programs like even the Jan Kimmel Awardees. 
Yeah. But at the grassroots level, also is very important to uh, encourage uh, like this college girls. That that uh, that is excellent. That is I excellent. am like the T nodal person for IT Kanpur, so thank you for that also. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. And uh, I, in fact, if you ask me, with, uh, I've got some of the pictures taken from these uh, Vigya Jyoti girls. I remember from Haridwar uh, area, and they went to the AIMS, and I shared that photograph of the girls sitting with a cardiologist and you know professor of cardiology which was in my because i was so moved to see that picture how glad the girls were there i put it in my whatsapp as my you know dp for you know because all the girls were so happy to meet a cardiologist in surgery and, and they were class 9 to 11 12 i think right. you know, school going girls right. and, you know, uh, so i really uh, uh, you know uh, i really take your point and suraksha is also listening here thank you Thank you very much. We can move ahead. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. Indeed, these are very important programs from BSC and as well as several of these programs from BJP. So I hope uh, all of you liked and appreciated this event organized today on Women's Day jointly by GBT and ICCB Limited. To conclude the event, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Rajesh Gokhale, Secretary GBT, and Dr. Dinaka Salamke, Director ICCB, for gracing the occasion and sharing their valuable thoughts. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Sanjay Mishra and Dr. Suraksha Bhuvan for supporting human-centric schemes including biocare as well as supporting the program management related ICGB, ICGB PM. Thanks to DPD and offices of Dr. Mishra and Dr. Bhuvan for support, their support for organizing today's event. Uh, and I thank all the speakers for participating in the event, their presentation. It was indeed very nice to know their success stories. Uh, uh, we also thank Dr. Surira and her team to organize today's event, as well as ICGB's uh, administrative and technical staff for their support. Finally, I thank all the uh, audience here who joined us today. We intend to organize a uh, full day conference next year and uh, hope to see you uh, next year in person. Thank you all. Thank you very much. We conclude the event for today.